No, no, it can't be. Why, why do you hate me? I, I double checked the math, I swear. I did the research. Dub and sub. Not a casual fan, no. Of course I read the comments. Why, what's up? No. Oh. Jeez, did you see that like-dislike ratio? What a nightmare. Internet. Welcome to Film Theory, where we don't shy away from the scariest corners of the internet. And I'm not talking about the dark web or Russian hackers, I'm talking about online reviews. Now if you've made any YouTube videos of your own, you know the scariest part of being online is what everyone else thinks about you being online. In a place where everyone is an influencer in some way and can review anything at any time, there's some serious stress when it comes to putting yourself out there to be judged. I mean, just look at me. To a lot of people, I am the literal cancer of the internet that they just can't chemotherapy away. Sorry guys, I can't help it if people take my theories just a wee bit too seriously. But YouTubers are nothing compared to the paranoia of big movie studios, where the biggest companies on the planet spend the biggest dollar amounts on the planet to make sure that you're getting the best impression of their movie. Whether it's through cool marketing gimmicks like recreating the entirety of Westworld, or just telling you that Ebert and Roper gave it 35 thumbs up. Movie reviews that come out before anyone has had a chance to see a movie can mean the difference of millions of dollars at the box office. Just look at one of the best examples from last year. Justice League, one of the most intensely judged and also least watched movies of 2017. Critics hated it, fans were divided about it, and by the time it came out, almost no one went to see it. Even more bizarrely though, for a movie that didn't have itself a lot of viewers, it certainly caused an all-out internet war on places like Rotten Tomatoes, a site that is known for tanking box office sales if it puts out a bad review score. Things got so heated that it wasn't all that surprising when accusations of review rigging started to pop up, claiming that the review weren't from real moviegoers, but were instead from the scourge of the internet, bot accounts. Seriously, accusations surfaced all across the internet on both sides of the aisle, with one side claiming that Marvel and Disney unleashed bots with Marvel bias to tank the performance of Justice League, and on the other side there were accusations that DC had to create fake bot reviews so that they could still claim that people liked the movie in the first place. And honestly, if you stop and think about it, can you blame any of this suspicion? Take one look at the reviews on Rotten Tomatoes for Justice League, and it definitely seems like some Something fishy's going on. An 80% audience approval rating? I gotta say, that made me do a little bit of a double take, especially when you compare it to the critic score of 41%. Did audiences really like it nearly twice as much as critics? I mean, I saw the movie and it was fine. It wasn't as high as an 80%, but it definitely wasn't as low as a 40%. It was okay. But could DC be using bots to up its score to ensure that America saw the red-orange fight scenes that they had worked so hard on? Is it really that far-fetched of a claim? These movies cost hundreds of millions of dollars to make, so wouldn't it make sense for the big studios to spend just a little bit more to nudge the odds ever in their favor? So that, ladies and gentlemen, is the episode of today. Explore the world of bots in order to determine whether the reviews of Justice League were influenced either for the good or the bad by a bot army attack. Don't just believe the speculative headlines. Today, the truth shall be revealed. Every day, more and more stories seem to start circulating about bots. Bots rigging elections, Yelp bots rigging reviews of restaurants, but to understand how bot systems work and to figure out whether it's possible for movie studios to rig a system like Rotten Tomatoes, we first have to have a solid understanding of what bots actually are. The term gets thrown around quite a bit, but do you actually know what a bot is? Before researching this episode, I thought I did, but the world of internet botting is a much deeper rabbit hole than I first realized. Web robots, or bots for short, are basically an online program that can do a whole bunch of little tasks automatically without anyone actually having to control what's going on from a computer. In theory, they're awesome. They're basically the worker bees of the internet that can complete the same task over and over and over again without a human having to waste the time to do it. And in a lot of cases, they are a good thing. There are new stories coming out about bots being able to help make people's jobs easier, from answering tech support questions without keeping customers on hold for hours, to stopping 
stopping streams of negativity and harassment on social media. 75% of executives at the world's biggest companies say that using bots for things like talking to customers isn't just an if, it's a win. So then, what's the big problem here? Well, the issue is that the technology is getting so good that you can't tell a bot from a person, which makes it almost impossible to trust anything that you see said on the internet. To show you what I mean, let's take a look at one type of bot, the IRC bot. The IRC, or Internet Relay Chat Bot, can be designed to look like a person on any website that has a chat function. The IRC bot can be designed to automatically reply to someone with helpful information, anything from the weather to the best temperature to cook a steak, but it can also be programmed to respond to specific language cues. This means it can scan any comments or chat from users and look for specific keywords, from people's names, like Bernie Sanders, to phrases like net neutrality or gun control. And then, because they're bots, they can be programmed to respond with anything that the user wants them to. Anything from profanity, to hate speech, to anything else that might start a major internet meltdown. And it only starts to sound more like a conspiracy theory when you look at social bots. Social bots are exactly what they sound like. Bots that are designed to interact with people in a social way. The same way that real people online interact. Building relationships, teaching each other, even swapping personal information. Believe it or not, the first social bots actually started being developed way back in the 1950s with Alan Turing and his famous Turing test for AI. Specifically, if a human can't tell they're talking to a robot, then the robot is actually AI that passes the Turing test. Well, that's the idea that's at the foundation of social botting. Nowadays, the vast majority of social bots can't pass the Turing test. I mean, a quick look at the comments of a lot of the videos on this channel and over on Game Theory will show several bots of my avatar and some ridiculous promises about a free Xbox or something. Don't ever believe those, by the way. I do my best to block them and flag them as spam, but, you know, just in case you ever see that sort of stuff, it's not from me. You can tell my real comments because 99% of the time they contain a cringy joke. And I swear I only do that to differentiate myself from the bots. You believe that, right? But just because we're not creating full AI yet doesn't mean that we're not moving in that direction and fast. On Twitter alone, the New York Times reports that there are three types of social bots. A schedule bot, which posts content every hour on the hour, or however it's programmed. This honestly isn't much more powerful than, like, say, Hootsuite, a social media management tool, but it can be used to mimic the regular times that real people or brands might be posting content on social media. Then, there's the second type, the watcher bots, that scan lots of other Twitter user accounts for information, then react if they flag something interesting, like a keyword, or if something changes on the account. This kind of bot can be used to amplify breaking news, or track and auto-respond to big news stories as they unfold. That's great for things like emergencies and natural disasters, but it starts to get problematic when the news isn't coming from reputable news sources. Or worse, when the news is actually just a complete lie. Lastly, there are the social amplification bots, and these are the ones that are the most famous because they're responsible for promoting things on social media that are more often than not lies. They're also the ones that famous stars have bought over the years to pad out their following and juice their numbers. Everyone from Justin Bieber to... No! Not Paul Hollywood! Celebrity chef and crusty co-judge of the best reality food competition in the world, The Great British Baking Show? I mean, I would expect this from Bieber, but Paul, you're a man who literally judges a baking show featuring 70-year-old British grandmas using ingredients that they grew in their own backyard gardens and has literally no prize. Have some integrity, man! Ugh! I want Mary Berry back. But okay, so now that we know what bots are and the different ways they work and which ones celebrities use to try and look cool, or more accurately, get more money out of brand deals, we can now see how a lot of these different kinds of bots come together to either artificially help or artificially hurt a lot of what we see in entertainment and media. Botting, especially the social amplification bots that I just mentioned, become a big problem because it's not just a few positive or negative reviews you're affecting, or even poor Ben Affleck's sensitive feelings, it's dollar signs, and big dollar signs. The New York Times has called this phenomenon the influence economy, which basically means means that however popular you or your movie is online, it will directly impact how much money that movie makes. So to see if I could suss out whether there was a botting conspiracy afoot in the DC Universe, I got some help from a member of the Theorist team who has a fancy programming background to help me look into the review scores of Justice League, using a natural language sentiment algorithm. Now, this is basically a computer program that can learn the overall feeling of some text, and then
can help to tell if it's a bot or not. It's obviously not an easy task. You can't simply program if happy then good, if sad then bad to get this sort of thing right. Instead, what we did was collect a set of sample reviews and then told the computer what the answer key to the review was so that it knew to tell a good review from a bad review. The data then gets fed into the algorithm as the algorithm tries to find a model that'll correctly predict all the answers given to it given all the data from all the samples. In simpler terms, it's basically like in school when you had to find a regression line or a line of best fit through a bunch of random points on a graph. Except the random dots are all of our sample reviews and we're trying to find the best fit line that predicts whether those reviews are going to be good or bad. After a few hundred iterations of the algorithm, we felt comfortable that the system was really good at finding the line of best fit to identify positive and negative elements in the text and even saw that it was getting really good at predicting how many stars a reviewer might be giving based on the sentiment that they had written into the text of the review. So what happened when we trained an algorithm to analyze Justice League reviews? Well, at first what it uncovered was definitely weird. There were a slew of mediocre to even negative reviews that were still rated at five stars. Reviews might have mentioned that the pacing was off or that there were some characters who didn't develop, but then they still gave it a perfect five stars. Here's an example of a post that the algorithm had estimated to be a two-star review, but that the reviewer had actually given a five-star review to. Quote, the plot is shaky and has questionable storylines. Character portrayal and team chemistry have great potential to be fully utilized on future setup. Not for all audiences for sure, but some comic nerd might get excited. Now, you may argue that that's a three or even four star rating, but most of us would probably agree that it doesn't seem like a five star review. Some users are even more upfront with their criticism, like one review that specifically claimed it gave the movie four out of five stars at the end, but then clicked a five star rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Reviews that the algorithm flagged as being three star stars or less constituted about 10% of the five-star reviews when we initially tested back in December. When we did further testing later in the month, that had actually dropped to only about 7% of the five stars. In short, what that translated to was limited evidence of botting. The reviews weren't being inflated, or at least they weren't inflated by algorithmic means. Instead, what the data showed us was that the fans were giving the movie five stars, but were still being critical of the film in the comments. It wasn't an army of social bots inflating the score, it was the reviewers themselves. But why? The place where I started to see the real answers to this ended up being a place I didn't expect it. Criticism of critics. Now, it's no secret that the DC Universe hasn't been the critics' darling like Marvel, so much so that a lot of online commenters have called it the Marvel bias. In reviews for Justice League, phrases like, the critics were wrong, appeared in about 17% of all Justice League reviews, and accusations of Marvel bias occurred in about 10%. That is a huge number of reviews, and all this data tells us a story, but not a story about botting or Disney or DC conspiracies. It tells a more human story about a fan base that feels attacked and a fan base that's had to go on a radical defensive. To many of these DC fans, giving the movie an accurate rating is just letting Marvel win, as the critics drown the score with unfairly biased negative reviews, and so they in turn resort to giving the film an overly positive score to compensate, hence that huge divide between critic and audience totals. That is the true story here. And Honestly, I thought about leaving the episode here, stating that after a lot of research and even going so far as to develop our own bot-detecting algorithm, that there was no inflation of scores going on, that this is actually just about a really passionate fan base trying to save their favorite franchise from extinction. But I don't think that I would be doing the movie or the fan base any favors by not asking the obvious question here. Are giving extra five-star ratings going to help the DC fans get what they want? With such a large disparity between the ratings and the the sentiment of the reviews, it seems clear that DC fans could be happier with the movies that they're receiving. So could more honest reviews actually help fix the DC universe? Well, not to show any Marvel bias, because honestly, I really don't care. I'm just rooting for any kind of theorizable superhero movie that I can make episodes out of and that are enjoyable to watch. But this situation actually did happen in the MCU. At a meager 66% critic review and 77% audience approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes, Thor the Dark Dark World is one of the worst rated MCU films, and that made Chris Hemsworth, aka Thor, take notice. An especially scathing review by Kevin Smith convinced Hemsworth that he needed to step in to make major changes happen across the look and story of the next Thor movie. He got really into the details, even specifically mandating that Thor needed to cut his hair and lose his hammer Mjolnir. It's important to note that it was because Kevin Smith is such a Marvel fan that his review hit so close to home. Quote, Hearing someone like Smith, 
who represents the fanboy world, was such a kick in the ass to change gears. We sort of had nothing to lose. People didn't expect what we did with it this time around. End quote. Ultimately, it wasn't some fancy critic review or a highbrow article in The New Yorker that made the filmmakers rethink future movies. It was a really passionate fan who leveled fair criticism at them. And it worked. With a 92% critic approval and 88% audience approval rating, Thor Ragnarok proved that the studios can make better movies when they know what they need to do. Not only that, but that same review from Kevin Smith was credited all over the place as to the reason why Thor Ragnarok was so much better than the previous movie. So while a lot of fans of course want to run to defend their favorite franchises, it's important to know that fans have some of the most powerful voices in the industry. And a lot of times, it's the fans, not the critics, not even the bots, who get the credit for pushing for big changes in their favorite fictional universes. So go forth and use your powers for good, DC fans. No need to artificially inflate your scores. Don't worry, they're not just gonna stop making movies about Batman, Superman, and The Flash just because a couple underperformed. What the DC Universe most needs from you now is an honest assessment of how they're doing and a critical look at what they can be doing to improve the franchise moving forward. That, whether you're a DC fan, Marvel fan, Star Wars fan, or just general movie fan, is the most valuable thing that you can provide these studios as they make movies going forward. And remember, that's just a theory. A film theory. And you know what's even more useful than an online bot army trying to make you more popular? A browser extension that saves you hundreds of dollars on the purchases you're already making online. I'm talking about Honey, the free browser extension that automatically finds the best coupons on the web, so you always get the best prices on everything you buy online. Automatically. I mean, I don't even have to explain it, just look at how easy this is. I want to buy this thing, right? Boom! Honey notification pops up in my window saying, hey, you're about to overpay, we found a way to save you cash. Click this button and get free money. See? This is technology reaching its true purpose here, people! Saving me money! That is a wad of cash that I would be needlessly handing over if it wasn't for Honey. And Honey Money works at all the places where you actually want to buy things, too. Like Amazon, Macy's, eBay, even travel sites like Expedia for buying your plane tickets home, or Papa John's to buy you things like pizza. Honestly, with the money Honey's saving me, I've been able to treat old team theorist over here to some nice group lunches. Or, at least I was treating him to some nice group lunches until Jason overdosed on Chipotle burritos and then we all had to suffer the consequences. Anyway, you too can be like Jason and have your pants full. Only your pants will be full with all the cash that you're saving saving thanks to Honey. It literally takes two clicks to install, so rub your mouse all over that link below to add Honey to your browser for free right now, or just go to joinhoney.com slash film theorists. That's the link below, or joinhoney.com slash F-I-L- You know what, that's just stupidly long to type into your URL bar. Just literally click the link in the top line of the description. Like, save you and everyone else a bunch of time and just do that. Do it now, because every purchase you make after now is just you throwing money away. Saving money has never been so easy or so sweet. Get it? It's sweet because it's honey. It's whatever. Anyway, just download the thing. Now clean up your mess, Jason!